Hallelujah. Amen and amen, brothers and sisters. We're grateful to Elohim for the depth of revelation he has released on this new course, Understanding the Human Nature, second edition. And the Lord is kind of, you know, touching up here and there to make it smoother, to make it easier to understand. And we've done eight lessons so far, and today we look at the second part of the key to kingdom life which is perfecting holiness in the body, the body realm. Let's pray. Father in heaven, thank you for your goodness and mercy, for your loving kindness. Thank you for the opportunity received from you. We pray that your spirit will take the things of Yeshua and reveal them to us now, that we may come to where you have ordained us to be. In Yeshua's name we pray. Amen. Brothers and sisters, we'll begin this lesson by pondering over... 2 Corinthians 7, 1. Having therefore these promises, he says, Dearly beloved, let us cleanse ourselves from all filthiness of the flesh and spirit, perfecting holiness in the fear of Elohim. Now this is a mouthful in the course of this, in the, in the process of this course, We've seen that it is Holy Spirit that sanctifies us wholly, completely, and he uses the word. The word of the Lord is able to pierce through spirit, soul, and body to reveal the thoughts and intents of the heart. But here we are told that there is also a capacity in us to cleanse ourselves from all filthiness of the flesh and spirit. The flesh is the body and the soul combined. Brothers and sisters, Let's therefore consider the fact that the physical body is a marvel of creation. Such a marvel that David in Psalm 139, 13-18 says, Thou hast possessed my reins, thou hast covered me in my mother's womb. I will praise thee for I am fearfully and wonderfully made marvelous I that works that my soul knoweth right well. My substance was not hid from thee when I was made in secret and curiously wrought, curiously wrought, in the lowest part of the earth. Isn't that where the Lord took Adam from? The earth scooped and began to create. Brothers and sisters, one internet source that I, I don't know the author said something about the human body. Let me just mention a few things for you that will marvel you that the average human brain has about 100 billion nerve cells. Nerve impulses to and from the brain travel as fast as 170 miles or 274 kilometers per hour. Now the stomach needs to produce a new layer of mucus every two weeks or it will digest itself. It takes the interaction of 72 different muscles to produce human speech. The average life of a test board is 10 days. Human thigh bones are stronger than concrete. Babies are born without kneecaps. They don't appear until the child reaches two to six years of age. It takes the stomach an hour to break down cow milk. The average human head weighs about eight pounds. In the average lifetime, a person will walk the equivalent of five times around the equator. A human scalp has 100,000 hairs. 100,000 on each human. And they say something, the average human blinks their eyes about 6 6.2 million times a year, averagely. Men and brethren, hair is made of the same substance as fingernails. The average surface of the human intestine is 656 square feet, 200 meters. Men and brethren, the human body is composed of about 80% water. The average human will yield, will shed 40 pounds of skin in a lifetime. The human heart creates enough pressure to squirt blood, 30 feet, enough pressure to squirt blood, 9 meters. Men and brethren, certain things about the human body is just a marvel. When you have the notes, you can take care of some of the other ones. So the human body is a marvel. Unfortunately, among all the, the three parts of the body, spirit, soul, and body, we tend to, you know, relegate it. We tend to ignore it. And I think that's a problem as we're going to see. So let's take note of the lust and cravings of the soul 
are the chief issue of the human body. The human body often works with the soul. So what the soul lusts for, desires, whether it's permitted or not, the cravings of the soul are going to affect the body. And the human body has its own kinds of cravings which may war against through spirituality. And because the physical body lives within a fallen world, an environment, corrupt environment, it is normally pulled towards that which catches its attention and holds interest. But they say, love not the world, neither things of the world. For if any love the world, love father is not in him. For all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, the pride of life. These things beam right back to the human you know, soul, and the human soul propels the body towards the things that normally are forgive, forbidden. And that's why, because the body is a medium or vessel, at times it doesn't make interpretation of external stimuli on its own. It relies on the soul to interpret what it sees, hears, touches, feels, and smells. And this is interesting. We're talking about a vessel. This is a cup of water. Okay, that means the human as a vessel was inside the spirit and the soul. And the soul, being the realm of self expression, the buffer between the body and the spirit, tends to interpret things that are seen or heard or felt or touched. What the soul interprets often influences what the body does. If the soul is unsanctified, its interpretation of what the body makes contact with or is exposed to will trigger negative motions which deconstruct the body further and make it progress towards sin. This tendency to crave for what is worldly, what is sinful or negatively impacts spirituality is what is called lust, the opposite of faith. You see, faith draws down what the Lord wants the believer to possess. Lust draws down what the fallen nature of man desires that may be contrary to Elohim. Lusting after what Elohim specifically for prohibits in constitution of the kingdom is the root of all sin, just as it was for Eve in the Garden of Eden. Because what happened at the Garden of Eden? Satan threw that shiny object before her, questioned what Elohim said, and cost her soul to stretch beyond the spirit and influence the body, the hand, to take what was forbidden, and then sin came. And that's why James 4, 1 to 5 says, From whence comes wars and fightings amongst you? Come there not hence, even of your lust, the war in your members, the things, cravings in the members. You lust and have not. You kill and desire to have and cannot obtain. You fight and war, and yet you have not, because you ask not. You ask and receive not because you ask and miss that you may consume it upon your lust. A lot of prayer, believers pray, are lost. They are not prayers of faith. They are lost. And Yeshua called it out in Matthew chapter 6. He says the Gentile prayers. So you see a prayer meeting in a church of three, four hours. And the prayer meeting from beginning to end is give me, give me, give me, give me, give me. Nothing about God. What is your purpose for our lives? What are you challenging us to? What do you want us to focus on? What do you want us to do? It's only God, God, give me, give me, give me, give me. He say, look, a list to pray and miss. He said, verse 4, ye adulterers and adulteresses, know ye not that friendship of the world is enmity with Elohim. Enmity. Whosoever therefore will be a friend of the world is the enemy of Elohim. Do you think the scripture said in vain the spirit that dwelleth in us lost it to envy? Does it mean we're not interact with the world? No. He says a place where we, if we come to a place where what we desire is to make us be like the world and make us accepted by the world, we can get into a problem right there. Then we are also told in 1 Peter 4 from verse 1, For I'm as much then as Christ has suffered for us in the flesh, arm yourself likewise with the same mind. For he that has suffered in the flesh has ceased from sin, that he no longer should live the rest of his time in the flesh to the lust of men, but to the will of Elohim. For the time past of our life, may suffice us to have wrought the will of the Gentiles when we walked in lasciviousness, cravings of the body, 
lusts, excess of wine, revelings, banquetings, and abominable idolatries. These things can afflict a believer, and the body will turn towards the grave. The body will turn away from the Lord. So instead of taking responsibility and crying to the Father for mercy, some people are prone to give excuses when they permit or allow their physical bodies to basically drag them down to sin of various types. Some even blame Elohim God, while others are quick to blame Satan. Here's what James 1, 13, 15 says. Let no man say when he's tempted, I'm tempted of Elohim. For Elohim cannot be tempted with evil, neither tempted he any man. But every man is tempted when he is drawn away of his own lust and enticed. The same thing he faced at the Garden of Eden. Then when lust had conceived, he bringeth forth sin. And sin, when it is finished, bringeth forth death. This is the process of the construction. That once the enemy can throw the fiery darts, but they mean nothing until... The soul says yes to them, and then the soul activates in the body a desire for those things, and the body succumbs. That's why the Lord is giving us this teaching. This teaching series, this particular course, I believe is not for, it's not for advanced class. This course should be for the first believer, the first, the early believer, the person who just be saved, among other things, for discipleship. Why? If a believer knows the things the Lord has dealt with in this course, is most likely to have a better yielding to the process of the Lord and a better spiritual growth than one who doesn't know. What did Yeshua tell us in John 10.10? 10? The chief commit not but to steal, to kill, and to destroy. I am come. He didn't stop there. I am come that they might have life and they might have it more abundantly. And in 1 Peter 5, 8 and 9, we are told, be sober, be vigilant. Because your adversary, the devil, as a roaring lion, walketh about, seeking whom may devour. So when there are solicitations for the body to commit sin, the adversary is at work. And you know what? He still has the liberty, the license to walk about, seeking whom he may devour. But the Bible didn't tell you that he can devour you. He said in verse 9, whom resisted fast in the faith knowing that the same afflictions are accomplishing your brethren that are in the world, resisted fastly, that your body is being pulled to one evil or the other, is not an excuse to now succumb. You are not powerless. You are not helpless. You are a child of the Most High. The body needs to be brought under subjection through spiritual discipline. When the body is left alone, it can go rogue towards sinful proclivities. That is why it needs to be brought under subjection to leadership of the spirit man under the leadership of the spirit of God. When it is thus aligned, the body ceases to act independently. You see, if we allow the Lord to do what this course has told us, sanctification, spirit, soul, and body, and our spirit man has ascendancy, ruling our soul, feelings, emotion, thought, and all that, and in turn, ruling the body, the body will not go rogue easily. The body will cease to act independently. That's why spiritual disciplines such as constant study of the Word creates knowledge and understanding of the mind of the Father and an inward purification of impulses. And by regular, consistent prayer, there is heightened awareness of the presence of Elohim in all situations. Many believers tend to forget his omniscience and his omnipresence. And that's why people think you can switch on God when other people are there and switch off God when people are not there. Men and brethren, it is important to know that such switching on and off is a sign of babyhood. So the Bible tells us there is a sin that he considered the worst sin against the human body. What is it? Immorality. Living in sexual impurity whether lustfulness, lasciviousness, or actual act of sinning with somebody of the opposite gender, living together or having interaction that's intimate when you are not married or people who are married going outside the marriage union, the marriage bond to look for satisfaction emotionally and physically from other people. 
But that's why we're told in 1 Corinthians 6 from verse 9, Know you not that the unrighteous shall not inherit the kingdom of God? But be not deceived. Then he mentions some specific sins, and you'll be surprised. A lot of them are sexual in nature, neither fornicators, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor effeminates, those who do cross-living, cross-destined, try to mend, try to be like women and all that, nor abusers of themselves with mankind, those who do all kinds of things with their body as if it doesn't matter, God didn't create it. He said, nor thieves, nor covetous, nor drunkards, nor revilers, nor extensioners shall inherit the kingdom of God. But such were some of you, but you are washed, but you are sanctified, but you are justified in the name of the Lord Yeshua and by the Spirit of Elohim. And he said, verse 12, all things are lawful to me, but all things are not expedient. All things are lawful for me, but I will not be brought under the power of any. Listen, certain things may be lawful, for you, they are not expressly illegal, but they are not expedient. And even in that, you know that you're going to make a choice that is consistent with Elohim. Then he says something in verse 13, meats for the belly, that's food for the belly, and the belly for meats. But God shall destroy both it and them. Now the body is not for fornication, but for the Lord, and the Lord for the body. And Elohim had raised up the Lord and also raised us up by his own power. Then he says, Know ye not that your members, your bodies are members of Christ. Shall I then take the members of Christ and make them the members of an harlot? He said, God forbid, God forbid that that same body that is meant for the Lord as his tabernacle is not going to join in sin in any shape or form. Then he said in verse 16, what know ye not that he which is joined to an harlot is one body for two, say they shall be one flesh. So any act of immorality is deemed evil in the sense that it is taking the body away from the exclusive use of the father. Then he says in verse 17, but he that is joined unto the Lord is one spirit. This is a powerful statement. First Corinthians 6, 17, he that is joined to the Lord is one spirit, the same spirit that planted Yeshua in the womb, the same Holy Spirit that came upon Yeshua bodily at the baptism of John, that is the same spirit that is put in us first when we are saved, when he convicted us of sin, righteousness, and judgment, and showed us Yeshua, and sealed us into Yeshua after the regeneration exercise. These things can take seconds or minutes to happen. And not to talk of when he now fills us with the Holy Spirit, he said, listen, we are one spirit with the Father. Then he says, verse 18, to all Christians, flee fornication, immorality, flee it. Every sin that a man doeth is without the body, all sins. But he that committed fornication sinned against his own body. Why? Verse 19, what? Know ye not that your body is the temple of the Holy Ghost which is in you, that you have of God and you are not your own, for you are born with a price. Therefore glorify God in your body, in your spirit, which are God's. First Corinthians 6, 9 to 20. Most of the time, the body of Christ, these things are not discussed enough. And God's people are living carelessly, living like, you know, lower beings. If it was somebody in a party, Christian, from there, immorality. You went somewhere, saw somebody in a conference, from there, in the illicit relationship and communication that leads to sin, Christians are being careless over these things. The Lord wants us to know that we are higher beings and the fact of our redemption places us far above the pay grade of the normal human beings. And those who claim it doesn't matter what we do with the body, as long as we have a relationship in quote with the Father are clinging to a fallacy. You can have a relationship with the Father and your body is going rogue against the same father, and you call it relationship. True salvation is by grace through faith. Those who are saved are required to give their physical bodies the space to become conduits of manifesting the nature, the presence, and power of Yeshua who reigns supreme in the heart. And this is the basis of a number of scriptures that the Lord wants us to consider, like Hebrews 2, 17 to 26, and also Titus 3, 1 to 8. Put them in 
mind to be subject to principles and powers, to obey magistrates, to be ready for every good work, to speak evil of no man, to be no brawlers, physical altercations, but gentle, showing all meekness unto all men. For we ourselves also were sometimes foolish, disobedient, deceived, serving diverse lusts and pleasures, living in malice and envy, hateful and hating one another. But after that, the kindness and love of God, our Savior towards man, appeared not by works of righteousness which we have done, but according to his mercy, he saved us by the washing of regeneration and renewing of the Holy Ghost, which he shed on us abundantly through Christ our Savior, that being justified by his grace, we should be made heirs according to the hope of eternal life. Then he concluded in saying, this is a faithful saying, that these things are will, are will that thou affirm constantly, that they which have believed in God might be careful to maintain good works. These are good and profitable unto all men. We are saved entirely by grace, not works, through faith. But if we are saved, there will be evidence by the fruit we bear. Part of it is that our bodies are not for evil. They are not for sexual immorality in any way. And that's why we need to be careful. We're going to discuss in detail in the next two lessons, but we'll just introduce a few things so that we can know about the sins of the body. The body is a house for the soul and the spirit. To that extent, what is done by the human while alive will be accounted for. First, temple of the Holy Ghost. Now, also temple of the spirit man and the soul, which is the eternal part of our being. When a human exercises faith in the blood sacrifice of Yeshua and Calvary, there is redemption which produces a new creature in the spirit man, according to Ephesians 2, 1 to 10, and 2 Corinthians 5, 17. The realms of the soul and body need to be continuously brought under alignment and leadership of that spirit man that was redeemed in the sense that it should take signals that are godly and holy and pure. To that extent, if the saint remains in the Lord till death, living obedience as it pleases him, you know what? The body will not be a candidate for eternal damnation, but along with the, the new body that will come from heaven, will with the spirit and soul enjoy eternal bliss with the Father. And that is why we need to make sure we are constantly aware that we're going to appear before the judgment seat of Yeshua. So for saints, it will not be a judgment to condemnation. The judgment seat is where the Lord will try our motive, our obedience, how we did his work, what he gave us to do, did he do it the way we wanted to do it, the things he appointed for us to be able to succeed. Did we receive those things, including if your parents, were you subject to their parents so that they would do their part? Destiny help us the Lord put in your life. Did you connect with them and stay aligned? Or were you too proud to receive them and things like that? Because a lot of people are not fulfilling their purpose. Part of it is right from the family. They kick away alignment with their parents to do their own stuff. Then they grow up. The Lord puts people in their path, maybe their first job, the person that opened the door, or other people, even spiritually, and they're careless or they are too proud to see their need. The result is that they struggle on their own, and all they can accomplish is not anywhere near what the Lord has in mind. And so that is why we need to come to understand that there will be nothing hidden when we're going for the judgment seat of Yeshua, as Mark 4, 12, 22 says, everything will be open. So in closing for today, we need to esteem our bodies highly without idolization. Don't idolize your body as to spend so much on the body to the exclusion of spirit and soul. There are people who would never buy a good Bible. But you know what? To attend every party function, take the credit card, swipe. That dress, $360 swipe, but they will never with $36 buy a Bible. The ones they have is torn. They won't buy. $36 is too big to buy on a Bible, but they unthinkingly they can swipe to buy that new shoe, that other thing, to be able to attend that wedding, that event. Brothers and sisters, we must make wise choices. So, 
Let's not downplay the significance of the body. On the other hand, don't idolize it. Don't spend much more time and investment on it than you should. Let's also not neglect it. Elohim did not make a mistake when he created the human body with such an exquisite design that we saw at the beginning. Though perishable with an expiry date called death, the human body is ultimately designed to be a tabernacle of the spirit man and soul, the eternal part of our beings. In other words, that's where they live. That's where they are housed. In order to truly fulfill divine purpose and stand before Elohim in the hereafter, we need to acknowledge, understand, and invest in the well-being of the body. Those who ignore this reality can give room for the enemy to afflict the body, leading to diseases which ground the spirit and soul from optimal functioning or what still cause premature death. There are people who died prematurely. Why? Because they consume things they were not supposed to consume. And one thing led to the other. That's the end. Age what? 32. And the Lord will have used them to do great things. But even before it starts, they're already gone. And people are just misusing the body in that way. And the Bible tells us in 2 Corinthians 5, 1, for we know that if our earthly house of this tabernacle were dissolved, then Paul made on. And also Peter took about 2 Peter 1, 13 and 14. He called the body a tabernacle. I'm going to put it off. That Elohim is interested in the wholeness and wellness of the entire being. Is evidence in 3 John verse 2. He says, Beloved, wish above all things that thou mayest prosper and be in health, even as thy soul prospereth. The three dimensions covered. Don't go for one, go for all. And it will require us to cooperate with the Father, to take good care rather than ignore or be careless with the part called the body. Things like appropriate healthy food, sufficient water, exercise to keep the systems going, and healthy choices concerning relationships and interactions with people who add value to our overall wellness and wholeness are conscious choices we need to make. I want to say to you, this is just introduction to a three-part series on the body, what we need to do that are more detailed the next part, and I urge you, don't just study this one, please make sure you also receive the other part of that. So by way of assignment, how would you describe the body in the light of revelations in this lesson? How would you describe the body too? Summarize the subsection titled, Lust and Cravings of the Soul, a Chief Issue of the Human Body. Three, why should Christians take good care of their bodies? Let's pray. Father in heaven, we thank you for the opportunity to receive your word. Father, interpret it further for us by your spirit and grant us a heart that is willing to hear, to receive, to absorb. Father, help your people that we all will give the body the adequate attention you require of each of us to your own praise and glory. In Yeshua Jesus' name, amen. Thank you so much for being with us on this program and watching and we believe you learned something and the Lord bless you. Now it's time to connect with us on our social media platforms. We have a daily live stream on Facebook, Monday all the way to Sunday, every day by about 10.30 a.m. UK time. And that's the same at Nigerian time. And you, it's either Apostle George, Monday to Friday, uh, to Thursday, Pastor Grace, uh, Friday to Sunday, and then in the evening of Sunday, we have two sessions from 5.30 to about 6, after 6, another one up to 7. So please join us on the live stream, and you're going to enjoy it. We also visit our website, www.gsom.ac, to download free ebooks. This course you just listened to, all these lessons, you know, there's an ebook we have free of charge. Everything we do is free. But more importantly, you can actually do your program on, you know, ebooks. You can do your program entirely on ebooks and with this video or anyone you want. You can also, if you want to do the Yes course or be, do the Master Class, you can go to www.kingdombooksclub.com and you can subscribe so that you can do it. You can also subscribe to our channels. This YouTube, 
gsom.tv and we also have a telegram channel gsom media you can send us an email at akclife.tv at gmail.com we love you dearly and we want to partner with you to make sure that the body of yeshua jesus is empowered with truth remember it is the teach train equip activate and release paradigm absolutely free of charge have a blessed day and we'll see you again soon